All right. My name is Rich Schmidt. I'm here with David Hunter. We're at Crew and Domain in Portland. It's January 23rd, 2024. And David, thank you so much for joining us today. Yeah, thanks for having me. Uh, first question is why wine? Oof, starting off with the hardest one. No, I mean, I don't know. You know, really, uh, I think uh, when it comes to wine is such a puzzle. Wine is such a, uh, you know, and everyone waxes pros about it in their own different way. But like, man, what product ties you to the ancestry of humankind, to spiritualism, to nature, to science, to economics, to history? I mean, you know what I mean? You can go on and on. So I think, uh, yeah, I wasn't born with, you know, a Grand Cru uh, wine in my nose or, you know, fetching bottles from my dad's cellar or anything like that, to say the least. Uh, so, you know, I definitely would have never uh, anticipated it. I was a music major, music business <laughs> major at SF State. And so, like, my joke right now is, you know, I got a bachelor's degree in the music industry and going for a master's, master sommelier title for wine. So, mm -hmm. it goes to show. <laughs> So tell us a bit about life before wine. Tell us about where you're born and raised and kind of path to college. Yeah, um, definitely unconventional. I was uh, born in England, actually, and uh, my mom kind of said hell with that and, and raised me in California uh, since I was like two or three. Uh, and then bounced around a lot of different towns in California till you know, I was in the Yosemite area, kind of for high school. Went off to, uh, and I worked in fine dining, you know, kind of from 16 years old, just like bussing tables, getting some serving shifts. Um, and that led me through working through college through Chico State and where I finished at San Francisco State. But once I made it to the Bay Area, uh, that's kind of when all the pieces started falling in place uh, for what came for wine. Uh, started working at this fine dining old school old school spot in san jose like you know joe dimaggio used to eat there had his corner booth and it was like you know there were ghosts it was mob money it was like the whole nine yards of 1940s san jose uh but they had a wicked wine cellar and the gentleman who uh owned the uh, sadly the restaurant's not open anymore but uh Jaleel samavarkian is his name iranian hard-nosed dude but Crispus suits and just walked it and talked it and he was the first person to start putting glasses under my nose and being like tell me what you smell Mr. Hunter tell me what you know and I was good with fruit I was like hey, raspberries cherries strawberries he's like what else Mr. Hunter what else Mr. Hunter and I mean just like off off in space not knowing what the heck to ask and that was kind of the first little planted seed. It wasn't like a love at first sight. Oh my gosh, I, I'm seeing stars now. You know, it was, it was, uh, that was the first seed. And then uh, I moved to San Francisco uh, where I finished uh, my degree I mentioned there. And it was there I started working at the first spot that, you know, kind of unlocked everything. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So at that point, let's, let's pause there for a second. At that point, what were your kind of thoughts on wine? Did you was, you mentioned not love at first sight? Were you excited about it at all, or was it just a means to an end? <laughs> yeah, I, it's funny because my grandma. I lived with my grandma at the time, and we're still, you know, in, in incredibly close. Uh, I just drank her buttery Chardonnay when I was out of beer. That was like literally it. We were, you know, we're religious SF Giants fans and we'd watch every single game. You know, this was the 2012, 2013, 2014 season. So a lot to be excited about as a SF Giants fan. And we, we didn't miss a single inning. And yeah, we were just polishing off her and classic stereotypical buttery, oaky, rich. She does she's never had a sushi roll in her life. And you know, that's her style. That's that generational taste palette. Uh, uh, but so that was really my intro with it. When I was, tw uh, I, my dad actually lives in Australia. And when I was 21, I went out there, uh, uh, kind of met him. And, you know, he's like, oh, well, what do you like to drink? Like, what about wine? You know, Australia's got some good wine. And I was like, all I said, I was like, well, I, I, can, I enjoy white wine. Like, or, you know, like, I mean, I don't know how many cheap Sauvignon Blanc, whatever the case that we drink out there. And now knowing that, 
I was 40 minutes of a drive to wine regions that I study now religiously and memorize all the producers and bottlings. I was like, I was there and I was drinking grocery store plonk. Like, you know, the, but then again, I wasn't into wine back then. So, you know, all those little components were there. Uh, but then I started, I worked at this tiny little Italian trattoria. Uh, it's a restaurant still in San Francisco called Seven Hills. Uh, and that was where the whole journey started. It was Italian. You know, there was, uh, there was a couple Oregon wines. I'll, I'll mention that in a second, but, but it was an Italian spot. It was, there was, you know, maybe uh, say like 14 to 15 uh, uh, wines by the glass, but it was such a small spot. You know, we do three turns a night, but small bustling, had like a lot of people would say like New York back alley bistro kind of uh, vibes. And that was the first place because it was such a small staff that we'd actually have the wine reps, you know, people that typically, you know, either you're a wine director, you taste with the wine reps if you're purchasing for a place, but as a server, you know, it, you seldom got that opportunity. So I got to taste with a lot of wine reps there and, and one of the first, the head server there, if you will, was like Vino Italiano, get it, read it. David Lynch, you know, like, like if you want to, you want to, you want to increase your check averages and stuff like that, like read that book. I, I bought it. I flipped through a few chapters and stuff. Uh, uh, but like in that kind of, so I was just started reading that and I just started learning a little more with some reps and like, aha. Uh -huh. But funny enough, it was like one of my dirty bong water college friends came to town randomly, came with his girlfriend at the time to eat at that restaurant. And I was like, yo, dude, whoa, man, like, that's so cool. You're in town. What are you up here for? He's like, I'm taking the sommelier exam. I'm doing all the sommelier. And I'm like, I would seldom even heard that word. And I look into it and I'm like, that dude, like, that dude could barely tune a guitar string. Like, what is, like, you know what I mean? Like, it literally inspired me from that alone. I was like, if he can do it, I can do it. And then funny enough, like, now on this journey and whatnot, like, I look back, and that was just the intro level. Like, you know, any, you got to study for it, don't get me wrong. But the, very, the intro level of the Quartermaster Sommelier is merely kind of, what is wine? what grapes are kind of grown where. It's very, very, very surface introductory level. But at the time, I felt like he was doing something really great. And as I'm starting to read a little bit more and I'm enjoying David Lynch, if you guys haven't read, I mean, he's such a brilliant wine writer, uh, uh, really has a way with words. So I was getting captivated by that. And then it was coupled with, um, you know, we all know like people at restaurants, you know, everyone, oh, can I try, is it by the, can I try it first? Can I have a little taste? You know, like, I don't know. So I'd say like 70% of patrons of a restaurant uh, Want, they want to, they're not going to buy anything if they can't try it first. Maybe 15% know what they want and like to ball out and another 15 are just in your hands. Mm -hmm. But a lot of people are like, eh, you know, I don't know. And I started getting a bit more bold the more I was studying. And, you know, it's so easy to sell a bottle when you can pour them a taste first. But I started kind of just standing on my own and just say, hey, look, you don't know me, I don't know you, but everything you four just ordered right now, if you, this bottle is $65, no, you can't taste it first. You know, but I just sort of really like, like really just like, I was like, because of the tomato base and this, and because of X, Y, and Z, this is gonna pair well. And it started working, like really working. And there's one night I'll never forget where it was again, busy, bustling Italian spot. We did like, there'd be sometimes 10 different verbal specials from the market and whatnot. So I mean, and, and I didn't pull punches. I would give this bloody sermon, like as if my life depended on it with each table. And I'd, just, I'd really just get into it with them. And I started getting interrupted. We're on like the second turn now. So my first seat wave of tables are leaving slowly and I'm, taking, I'm introducing the next wave. And I kept getting interrupted. And no joke, like three, four times I got interrupted kind of mid-sentence to this table to the point where I'm like getting annoyed. Like what? Oh, I'm in the zone. And there's people that just wanted to shake my hand, all just bright eyed, just smiling with their eyes, just saying, thank you so much. Like that, we would have never gotten that bottle. And it's what we're gonna remember you know, like it was that, it was one in particular night where I was like, whoa, I think I have not only just a knack for it, but I really enjoy enhancing people's experiences through that lens of food and wine. So kind of all those things, and they all happened within a few weeks of each other. And I went online, signed up for the first level is the intro level. 
the second uh, second level of the quartermaster sommeliers is the certified sommelier title. So that is uh, that's when you actually can call yourself a bona fide sommelier. And I signed up. Usually they recommend like a year in between it. I was feeling pretty brazen, so I signed up for both like within a couple weeks of each other. And it set the clock at like I had like five six months to then prepare. And that was when I just honestly never looked back. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and then it's funny because like a few things like later I found I found out that that wine list at Seven Hills was designed by a master sommelier, uh, 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 Nuncio Aliota, one of the old school, uh, uh, you know, real pillars. He was one of the first to pass, you know, back in the '80s in America, and you know the, I found that out. I couldn't help but laugh because I'm like, well. God, I was, I was very well taken care of as I'm learning certain wines. Like, so the, the only two Oregon wines, there were two Oregon wines on the list there. Uh, it was Antique Terra Botanivore and an Evening Land Pinot Noir Cuvée, which vintage had to have been like 2012. So I was like, yeah, yeah, this Oregon stuff's not that bad. <laughs> you know, like it, like it was like, hey, you know, the, the, they weren't too bad. and. Uh, uh, I also, there was a, a, a dear couple, I uh, still keep in touch with the husband a little bit, and they were just, you know, regulars at the restaurant, you know, a little well-to-do, but very down-to-earth, and and they uh, they said, oh, Dave, this is when I was preparing for the certified exam. They're like, oh, this is great. Uh, we want you to take care of us. We're bringing our favorite winemaker, our favorite winery in Oregon down to San Francisco, and we're hosting them for a big vertical library uh, uh, dinner. And that was uh, Patricia Green Cellars. And so they had to have been pretty endeared uh, members to actually get, now knowing how winemakers are and behave, like to get the winemaker out of there and like travel down to SF for this. Uh, but it was at the time, you know, it was like, I want to say like 05 to 09. And, and, I'm, and, and this was a small Italian spot. We seldom had tables over four. This was a party of eight. I was like, oh, great. I get to really do like a big wine service and, and, and all the glasses. And, and, and of course, you know, they're encouraging me to try uh, each and every one. So I can confidently say, confidently say that was my first real like little expose of like, hey, look at what Oregon can be and how it can taste like. Uh, it's funny, the winemaker at the time, uh, name escapes me, but he was a man of few words, except towards the end, I was like, you know, just something along the lines of, hey, did you enjoy everything, you know, and stuff, and he just points to his glass, and it was probably the dirtiest speckling of lip marks all around, I mean, grody, and he's like, that means I had a good time. <laughs> So I got to gotta love that. But uh, yeah, that was true. I had signed up for both portions of it. And I don't know if it's that kind of horse blinder component, but I, I, I just never looked back. I, I, like from the get go, you know, I, I can, I, get it becoming a master sommelier, became, like when I learned like that was the final evolution, that was the final goal. Yeah, that's where I really set my eyes on it. Um, not long after passing the certified, I kind of just kind of, you know, outgrew that tiny little space and uh, it was very mutual, but that's when I took the leap into Michelin star realm, which at the time, you know, San Francisco, very competitive food scene, you know, I take care of, you know, it was Michael Bowers, uh, the food writer at the time. And, you know, getting four stars from him was, you know, like winning an Emmy, you know, and, and, and we got to enjoy all these nice highs and lows, but still very small scale. It was worrying about TripAdvisor reviews. And, I, and the chef at there worked at three Michelin star restaurants prior to, and like, you know, so it kind of was like learning about this other culture, this other bracket that exists in the fine dining sphere. But as I was studying for certified, I think it occurred at one point or another, uh, I have no intent on being some career server or anything like that, you know, 24, 25, and you know, just kind of, you know, you're making really good money, fast cash and all that stuff. But I saw it maybe just initially as like, hey, this is a quick out to you know, stay, I love people, I love working with people, and I, it's it's never felt like work to me, which has been an easy way to stay with it. You know, some people really have to fake it and turn on that switch, and they're, they're acting. Mm -hmm. and, and that's the thing people miss, especially out here and stuff, is like, with, without personable service, I don't care if you're paying $500 a plate, I won't go back if the service is stale, stiff, and awkward. And, and, and you know, so that, that, that kind of fusion, 
uh, was was always there, but but yeah, I took the leap into the Michelin star realm, uh, and the guy who hired me, uh, which at the time, I mean, he was one of like the hottest psalms in the city, you know, he's on the, we're literally doing inventory and there's magazines with him on the cover of like wine journal and stuff. Yeah. Like, like literally like this guy is like, just blew the door open a few years prior. And, and he was in the, the, the ropes of passing the MS exam or going through the MS exam, which is now where I'm at right now. And so just even in that kind of short six, seven years, it's kind of crazy to see, you know, forwards and backwards, but, uh, yeah, that was at Michael Mina was where I started uh, over on California. It used to be Aqua, my, uh, real name stay spot. Probably one of the swankiest dining rooms still uh, on the West Coast at least. But that was where, you know, I started like as a seller rat. You know, I, I applied for the sommelier role. He's like, look, man, I got to get you in as a server and I'll get you, I'll phase you in, but it get you in the door. And, and yeah, my first job was taking care of the cases and cases of corked wine to send them back to reps and things like that. Or, you know, it, like we're doing inventory and I'd make the comment, I'm like, my goodness, like it's like the 18th different distributor. Like how many different distributors are these? Like, dude, you want a wine list that looks like this? You have to, like, it was really like things that now are just commonplace. And, you know, when you start, when you're in any industry long enough, you know, it's easy to like, oh man, like there's such a learning curve. There's a, uh, I'll never forget, uh, well, so, I mean, one thing that was really cool about Michael Mina was five of the people I worked with, four are now master sommeliers, and four were all, they were all at the advanced level, and they were all, you know, like, there was a little dregs of Chateau Yquem <laughs> dessert wine, and I'm just like, I've never, oh, man, you know, I've only been reading about this, and, you know, they look crossing their arms, looking at me like, oh, don't you remember your first one? And they're like, oh, don't you, you know, like, Poor little baby and stuff, and and, and that's just how it, that's just how it goes. But uh, yeah, no, there, uh, there's uh, more than a few moments I can look back on during those times, and uh, just from that, from a growth standpoint, you know, you it can be such a violent inhalation when you're trying to learn about the world of wine. But there's so much context to it. There's so much. There, there's so much to build upon, and you, you hear phrases like rote memorization, where it's hey man, you might cram it quick but it's not gonna last and in that context and stuff so yeah I was you know and uh, couldn't have been more fortunate to embark on the sommelier journey in San Francisco because I mean the community there although very competitive was still incredibly generous and welcoming um, one of my uh, closest friends Mark Gillido uh, just passed his master sommelier exam this uh, last year mm -hmm. and I mean he he led a tasting group that uh, you know this is where we met through and I mean you only get like a day off in Michelin <laughs> when you're when you're a wine director or whatever in a Michelin restaurant you're lucky if you get one day off a week and he would spend that day hosting blind tastings for you know 30 some odd people and doing like this like unwavering just generosity uh, and this giving it was it, it was not hard to get swept away with the community at large and you know someone's bringing like a 1966 Barolo or something or you know some crazy wine pops up and then you're like oh there's that history and there's that these other components to it so so yeah that was that was a little um and you know from there you know went to two other different Michelin spots so like all in all it was like seven years uh working in Michelin restaurants and I wouldn't be here right now talking to you if it wasn't for COVID well, that, that, you know, but I guess where we're, we're Oregon uh, kind of in, in, interplays with this uh, it was uh, in tw 2017. Uh, so I, I had uh, been a certified sommelier at that time. And uh, uh, my now wife, who's girlfriend at the time, she surprised me with a trip and we went up to Oregon for my birthday for like five days. Um, and she's like, hey, I kept the plans open so we can... I want you to be able to like organize what you want to do. And I was like, okay, we were in Willamette three days of the five, you know, the other two were the travel days. Uh, and those are real fond memories, you know what I mean? We just hit up as many as we can make it to. Um, and then consequently the advanced sommelier exam, which is the third level, and that's the level right before masters um, in 2019 and in 2020, it was held here in Portland, 
I was here for both of them. Um, and the, the one in 2020, it was March of 2020. So not only was they were sequestering everybody, you know, you know, so there was like seven, everyone was sneezing, coughing, hacking. No one knew. None of us were watching TV for four days. So that was like right when things were really going down. And uh, yeah, like myself and uh, one of the proctors of the exam, he's a master sommelier, we worked together and we both were at the airport getting an email from our boss saying, you guys got a quarantine because you've been in an airport. Uh, and a few days later, the uh, the whole food scene and you know the rest is history as we all know all too well. Uh, but yeah, once that happened because of these like three little mini trips I'd had up into the Portland area, you know, we, we, we had our eye on this place. We're like, hey, you know, hey, maybe we can bounce up here and, you know, had, had to have a good food scene, had to be close to a great wine regions and had to not be so far away from like family in the Bay Area. So, so, so that, that hit the box and yeah, that's a, yeah, right. April of 2020, we moved up here. <laughs> So we'll pick it back up there in a second, but I'm curious about, you mentioned kind of the intense inhalation of information as you're studying for this kind of thing. How does that affect, how did that affect in your case, your enjoyment of, or, or I guess your approach to wine, your relationship with wine? How does it go from, your, it's kind of a casual relationship, you like to drink it, you're selling it, to like trying to learn the whole world of wine. Yeah. How did it change your approach to wine? Yeah, um, that's good to think about. You know, I, I, when I was going for the certified sommelier exam, uh, you know, they have testable grapes. They have your classic, archetypical varieties and the way they can taste and, and, and reveal themselves. And so for that like six, seven months, I didn't drink a wine that wasn't classic. You know, people were like, oh, hey, cool, I got this Hungarian skin contact, something. I, I like restaurants, I would only drink, you know, if they had a Cru Beaujolais or whatever. I wouldn't have, you know, I, I really tried to dial that in, at least from the sense that there is so much to get distracted upon. Like in, in, in doing these tasting groups, you know, it's blind tasting is hard and it is a muscle. It, you get so many wrong before you start really honing it in. Uh, and I'd hear people being like, oh, you know, this reminds me of this like Semillon I had from Monterey County, you know, and stuff like that. Like, what is going on here, man? You're not playing, like there are little mini rules to the Court of Master Sommeliers. And in a way that kind of gave me structure. Uh, and so I, you know, first learn the classics and then start deviating towards what you like. I mean, I always have a soft spot for Italian wine because, you know, like Falangina from Campania and Etna Rosa, you know, Rosso, you know, like those, those wine styles, like I, I initially loved right off the bat, but I think I kind of, uh, I let my palate find me instead of like dictating my palate right off the bat. And I tell this to people now, I, when you're getting into it, like say yes to everything. It, it, it was, too many people have, you know, we all know people like this. They have one bad sparkling wine, one bad hangover off of cheap Chardonnay, and they swear off the thing for their whole lives. And it's crazy how, like I'm almost amused at how like, you know, on it, people went, no, never having sparkling wine again. <laughs> You're like, it just cooks. That's not, that doesn't count. Uh, but yeah, like that, that whole component, you know, I've really tried to just, yeah, say yes to everything. I think like, as, as I started working at different spots, getting introduced to, you know, not only just classics, but some of the best wines in the world, it really just set the bar. Um, yeah, you know, but then, um, I spent three years, almost three years, at uh, this restaurant, Lazy Bear, a uh, two-star spot in the Mission District of San Francisco. And yeah, I can go on and on about that place. It was really such a one-of-a-kind joint. But uh, they were known, they had an, one of the biggest uh, uh, depth of California vintages in, in the country. And just, I mean, vintage depth, like you wouldn't believe. We had like some odd 30 pages of ridge vineyards going back to the 60s and we were opening early 90s Pagani Ranch Zinfandel for you know squab and roasted pigeon dishes and things like that you know and you, you're yeah I mean it was just fishing with dynamite and you're tasting these wines that are just so preserved and just peak drinkability and so that it, it, that's where the rose lens glasses came on is wanderlust and there's still I can think of hundreds of wines I have not tasted still that I can't wait towards but what I Personally, what drove me through the Court of Master Sommeliers, like, of course, like, 
the, the service component is what keeps a lot of people out of it, and I understand that. And they're like, I'm never working in a restaurant. Why should I have to use a tray and know how to make a martini? I get that. But I, uh, I think there's so much more to it when it comes to it, because like, you know, and W said as well, it, it is great in its own right. My one bone to pick is it doesn't teach you about the producers who actually make the wine. It's very like, how, what's the weather? What's the soil? How are they doing their canopy management? But like, who makes it? Who, where am I gonna get to buy low and sell it? Where am I, where, where's my $20 wine that tastes like a $60 wine? You know, like but knowing the villages, knowing the bottlings, knowing the good vintages to go after versus those other things, that always made the most sense to me, just like practical. Just like, how, how can I drink better? And, and funny enough though, like as far as like tastes and wine go, like I have a lot of friends uh, in the wine industry that just like, Man, if they have $200, they'll buy a $180 bottle of wine, <laughs> you know, or something like that. I've just never, I've never been that way. I, I've, a lot of it's like, hey, you know, like when the right moment comes, the right mo the moment will be there. Um, but yeah, a lot of times I'm, you know, like going after aged Portuguese reds, you know, and for 40 bucks, you can still get 20 years of vintage depth. They're like aged Barossa, Shiraz is a style that I'm pretty open about loving. and. Uh, I've, I do enjoy kind of uh, incorporating age in warm, ripe, new world wine regions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But yeah, as my friends, one of my good friends say, the favorite drink is uh, my next one. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like it's, it's, I think it's too easy to like, yeah, I, my favorite wine's still out there. I know that, you know, or like I can think of incredibly you know, great memories and great moments and great bottles, but yeah, I think and then as you really turn that corner into, hey, I'm gonna try and learn everything there is to know about wine, it's like, dude, you come to that realization really quick. There's, there's no way to catch up to everything. So before the pandemic, um, I'm curious, what did you, as you, as you were you're working in fine dining and you're, and you're heading for, down the small, sommelier path, what did you sort of think as, did you have a long-term plan at that point? Did you have a long-term goal at that point? Where did you think you were heading? Yeah, um, honestly, I, I think I, I let um, let the master sommelier title in itself be that carrot on a stick because, like, he, he's, and it helped being with such a solid tribe of people that were going for the same goal. And you're like, man, you're like, dude, my, my favorite. There's been more people that have been to space than have passed the master sommelier exam. Yeah, there's tons of little, little ways to wrap your head around it. Yeah, International Space Station, man. You know, like, it, it is literally, like, it, it, I mean, it, the the gauntlet is, is so vast, and it is such an unattainable challenge. I think I've just, I let that kind of, that fixation drive the boat for the longest time. Uh, and then funny enough though, it's like, I'm sitting to, you, sitting to you talking right now in a wine shop that I run and curate and all this stuff, I would have never, ever told, I would have told you you were crazy, you know, a couple years ago with that. I, this was never part of the plan, but therein lies the journey, mm -hmm. you know, cause, uh, and I think now that, you know, I'm, I'm kind of finally about to punch my ticket and, and, you know, like get into the arena and have a fighting chance, you know, now I, I find myself thinking about like, okay, well, now it, it somewhat, I can see the mountaintop now, like what am I gonna do when I get up there? Mm -hmm. And that, that in lies the question, cause you know, it's not, you know, just like, just like, you know, I imagine a doctor or lawyer, so you don't just like get your doctorate and then there's your practice all set up and waiting for you, you know? And as a master sommelier, they say like, oh, you know, opportunity or that phone starts ringing. From, my, from what I've gathered, you know, a lot of people, that's not the case. You really have to make something to yourself. You really have to um, put yourself out there. And that's something that, I mean, many things, but one particular thing I enjoy about working retail now is, I mean, it, first off, it is like I am running, you know, my own business from the ground up, building something, so getting that experience. But, you know, in a restaurant, you're not responsible for booking guests. I'm responsible for making sure everyone who does the beverage pairing is styled up and having a wonderful time. I'm not responsible for getting those hundred people in for the evening. And when you're on this side of the fence, or you're in a different business of your own. I mean, you are, you're generating that. Uh, that that income and in, in getting it out there. So marketing for yourself, you know, this is you can't just sit on your hands and wait for people to come in. Mm -hmm. And so that's been something that uh, 
uh, I wasn't expecting, but it's proven to be really invaluable. But yeah, yeah I'm, I'm, I've always been keen on, travel is the biggest thing. You know, of all the different roles and all this stuff, like uh, quickly into, aside from all the romanticism and all the, you know, hoorah kind of stuff with, uh, you know, the wine industry, travel has always been, you know, the biggest thing I want, I want more of, you know, I, I've, I had plenty of people I worked under going to trips to Georgia and South Africa and all these different places just because they were the wine buyer at a at a hot spot. You know, so you so see I saw that pretty quickly and of course there's lots of scholarships and different things you can apply for, but that that, that travel component, as we all know, it's like if you've tasted a wine, man, can you talk about it to someone? If you've I got to go to France uh, for the first time wine wise this last summer and I'll catch myself talking to people about coat roti and then just like looking off over to the distance. I'm like, no, but like the context to which you can speak to it, man, it's incredible. And you know, I lived in a book for, for seven odd years before getting to experience that. So, so yeah, that context is huge. Yeah. And kind of thinking about blind tasting, you know, and uh, funny enough, you know, because everyone, you know, thinks of it either as a parlor trick or just like, oh, I don't have a good palate, but well, you can blind taste, and some people have an instinctual component to it, which is great, uh, but it only lasts for so long. And what I came to learn was that blind tasting is actually uh, a big portion of its like uh, theory. You know, if you're not studying, if you're saying, I think this wine's Brunello de Montalcino, 2020 vintage, da 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 da, you get, you know, not laughed out, but you know, you'd get ridiculed, you know, you get poked at because, you know, that's five years minimum before it could be released. Like, why? There's no way that's even on the market yet. And, and you know, I blind tasted instinctually for a while, got good that way, and then had to do a major reset and kind of bridge bridge the gap with with wine theory and all that stuff but uh but yeah yeah you know the right now it's a wild ride and i'm having a lot of fun getting to build crew and domain and 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 bring a little bit of that michelin component you know and i hope it's not cliche but really like bringing that white glove approach to retail and it didn't take me long to realize yeah i mean dude this town's great amazing food all this stuff but i'm not alone in thinking that like service and all that stuff is like kind of severely lacking or it's almost like they're all in on a joke together and we're just left out of it it's like they think we're making that coffee right now you know like no, it's, who knows whatever but like you know the, having that 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 real hospitable approach like you know in the way i designed the shop like i want it i want that that feeling when you walk in like wow this is really taken care of you know in a fine dining restaurant it's it's you know if one forks out of place you know it's not going to derail the whole show but when you've got 400 things all in their right place it's a feeling you know when you walk in you just it's it's a it's like your your mind's at peace mm -hmm. i had a chef who was obsessed with the 90 degree rule and he's a you know everything's orderly in 90 degree ratios and that's how if anything was off he you'd either you'd just silently aggressively move it or just you know yeah like that kind of thing but it's this obsession with aesthetic and and, and all these subconscious components that go into an experience and so yeah that's been that was something that was you know a pillar of of getting to open this place was that this wasn't going to be like, hey, did you find everything all right? Okay, see ya, <laughs> you know, kind of thing. We wanted to like really take people through the world of wine, it, bring an education component to it. Um, you know, needless to say, you know, again, mystifying wines, like well, what's something that everyone's so passionate about, but like so few people understand? I mean, football, I don't know, you know, or like, like even still, like, you know, there's, there's so much stuff that, that, that goes into it. And I, the longer you work in an industry, you do like, you get numb to the, the struggle of what it was like to start. And, and I've heard people saying like, boy, it's a beautiful shop, but I just feel intimidated. Mm -hmm. And, and there were the first t a couple times I heard that I was like really blindsided. I'm like, whoa, how could someone feel that way? Oh, hold on. Like, oh, I must not be doing a good enough job to make them not feel that way but you know, there's a there's a lot of uh, you know people put things on a pedestal or, or you know people again like i've i've seen guests taste a wine or like a wine maybe is like slightly flawed and they taste it like oh well i'm gonna stick with this bottle because it must be my palate i must not 
my palate must not be, this must surely be good and I must not be sophisticated <laughs> enough to enjoy it. You're like, you couldn't be more wrong. You know, like you, you, everyone's palate is their own and that's also what makes things so crazy. Um, whether it's your first glass or you've been drinking wine your whole life, but but still like the, believing in yourself, it, it's okay to say yes, to say no when it comes to something you like or dislike, but, but yeah, like it, it's a process, you know, so everyone goes about it differently. So, so you got out here in April 2020 and obviously the restaurant scene was not a place to be at that point. So how did you get from that to opening this shop? Yeah, um, and it was fine. So yeah, move, moving up here, my whole MO was, oh, I'm a work harvest. And at that point I'd done like six years straight of seven years straight of just, you know, dude, needless to say the fine dining routine, it's a, it's a, it's, it'll burn your wick at both ends, you know, or not getting off until 1 a.m. Some of this tasting group theory group at like 9, 9 a.m. the next morning and, you know, back to work at 2.30 p.m. And it's, and it was that rinse, wash and repeat for years. So I, I got to that point where I was like, man, I really want to, you know, see how the sausage is made and, and, and all that stuff. And, and yeah, COVID made that easier too. Cause I was like, Hey, look, that ain't, that ship sailed for a minute. And so I ended up working at, uh, Adelson. Uh, and I, I applied to a few spots. I wanted to go to a place that, you know, had some history, had, you know, not just anyone, uh, but sure enough, uh, uh, Matt Perry was the guy, he was the assistant winemaker there at the time. Um, cool dude, and we, we we got to be friends, and and just getting started with the harvest stuff, I was enthralled by. It. I thought it was super fun. Boom, wildfires, smoke tape that lasted three weeks, and everything went uh, bottoms up. Uh, and you know, I took that as a sign. <laughs> I took that. <laughs> I was like, you know what? That's you know, I think that's the wine god speaking lightly. But you want to talk about fish out of water, though? Like, I mean. I'm, I'm telling everybody I'm working with, I was like, oh yeah, you know, I'm gonna go to the dark side, I'm gonna start making wine, you know, and all this stuff. <laughs> like, my buddy who I worked with, who's uh, 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 now an uh, MS, <laughs> he just was like, dude, you realize we're the dark side, right? Like, like, like they think we're the dark side. I was like, what? No, I mean, we're, how cool are we? What are we talking about? <laughs> I'm, doing, I'm doing the right thing here. Uh, but you know, still, you know, not, uh, not a war of sides or anything, but like, I was mortified when I saw my first you know, palette of C and eight sugar or something like that. And those are things that like, dude, every winery adds sugar more or less, unless you're by law prohibited from doing so. But even still, like, it was like a little, like, man, I'd been in a suit and tie and, 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 you know, all this kind of stuff. Like there was like, there's a reality. There was, it was nice to see that there is the reality. Yeah. There are wasps and bugs and stuff everywhere. And you're, you know, like there, yeah, there, there, there is some unglamorous components to it, but the wildfire vintage being what it was, you know, it was like that whole harvest was a science experiment. You know, we still pressed a few lots and that at the time the thought was like, well, we might as well vinify our best plots. Everything's probably screwed, but let's see if our best plots can weather the storm or, or you know, just seeing how it interacts. So I mean, there's tons of valuable uh, experience from it, but they, they kept me on after they ended harvest early because they were like, hey, please like help us with some sales and stuff like that. So like I was helping them sell some wine club memberships and things like that for a couple, that was like my first winter in Oregon too. Uh, I'm, I don't know, I, I've heard too many people that have moved to Oregon, they all work in the valley, and then they're like, man, that drive gets to them. At the time, I was like, I had never been off before, like on a normal conventional hourly t time frame ever. So I'm like, oh, I'm gonna be off at 4 p.m., this is great. Oh yeah, two hours driving back through, back to Portland and stuff. So like, that was, it was a slog. It was a slog for that winter time. I can't say I was exactly like, you know, jumping for joy. And it was a bit of a, uh, that was when it was a bit of a culture shock where I was like, kind of, you know, at a really high pinnacle of what I was doing in SF. And then I'm like more or less working in a tasting room for a little bit with people that are, you know, you just still like, it was, it was kind of like a, what the hell am I doing right now? <laughs> um, got a phone call from a friend. There was a, a changing of the guard at a restaurant like Oswego and they needed, he's like, you, it's not perfect, but 
you know, you'd be able to control your own wine program and, and they need somebody to kind of polish it up and everything. And, uh, and so I, d I was there for about six, seven months. Um, um, yeah, doing the, doing the wine program and everything and, and, and did that. And serendipitously just met the guy who owns this place, uh, William Oban, uh, who, you know, funny enough, like even in our first interview, I was like, got a feeling like, I'm gonna look back in life and be like, before meeting you and after meeting you, kind of. It was like every once in a while, you know, we talked, you know, about people that are connectors and people that that, that have that magnification. And uh, I don't know, I'm gonna butcher it, but one phrase I've been really liking recently was, uh, "Only a fool needs a second opinion on a diamond," you know, something along those lines. And I've always that, that's always kind of rung true to me, where like a lot of times, me, it's like you can kind of just like sometimes you can just tell with people, and you're like, "Hey, man, this is gonna be a good person." That being said, uh, this was a little over two years ago. Now we're about, Crew and Domain will be open for two two years at the end of February. So, so yeah, it's longer than that now, but we met and uh, kind of shared this vision. At the time, this shop was just plywood, no paint, no nothing. And we kind of just toured it and, and kind of sharing that vision of what could be built and you know, I value the time I spent as a wine buyer places and working with the programs that I did because, yeah, I mean, there, it's it's not always, a, it's very seldom a blank check. I'm not saying that's, that it is here, just in general, like, you know, there, there's places I've worked for where, you know, you're nickel and dimed to try and bring on a new wine to do, to, to execute a certain vision. And when you work for someone who believes in the value of of investing in wine you know that's how lazy bear was like they believed in the value of investing in wine when COVID occurred they were able to stay afloat because we turned the whole wine cellar into a retail store dropped the margins a little bit we started bottling our fermented hot sauce and the two michelin star chefs were making the best breakfast burritos you've ever had in your life but like there was a line around the block and that's how they stayed open during COVID. um you know but but getting to you know uh, ownership here you know it's like we believe in, in in the value of wine in the investment of wine uh and you know the one phrase i've thrown around a few times is like you know there's people i work in the wine industry you know like a, a participant you know i'm in it but like that guy's really in it like he's on a texting basis with people i gotta study on flashcards and so like again it didn't take long i was like wait you're friends with who okay you're wait you're friends with that guy okay like you know i don't know there's just it was a nice connection and and funny enough, that was a year and a half into moving or living up here. And it occurred to me, I was like, dude, I've been up here an hour and a half. I hadn't even worked in Portland at all. So even just from like finding that friend group, finding finding that, you know, wine scene and stuff like that. You know, we've got the great people over at Willamette Valley Wine Storage over here. Uh, and, you know, the, the, you know, that's a nice little nest of some really great wine collectors and just people passionate about wine. So you know, in these last two years, moreover, like, that's where I've made, like, the bulk of my friends up here, and so, so it's, it's, it's been great. It's, 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 it's been able to provide me a way to get more immersed in the Oregon wine scene, um, and even still, like, to get to build what we're building here, and, I mean, because, like, do we, we do blind tastings every week. We teach the public how to blind taste. We do very specific themed flights every week where it's like, I know that people are drinking New Zealand. And you know, if I wanted just people to f <laughs> flood this place, I'd do champagne in Sicily every other week. Cause that's, everyone only cares about Italian wine and champagne in this market. But like, I know that New Zealand isn't the hottest drawer. I know that like, you know, boutique, whole cluster Chilean projects and stuff haven't caught in people's attention, but that's where we get to stand on that confidence. Where it's like, we've put in the legwork. We are really passionate about what we're doing, but we have the education and the, the clout and the know-how to back it up. And that's, I just think like without context, it, context is key. That's the, that's, that's the biggest thing. Uh, there's a lot of people, like I love the enthusiasm for wine in this town and in Willamette Valley as well. Like I took my, my family from England, was out here for our wedding and we were tasting at some wineries and stuff and you know, I can't help myself. I'm always on these sidebar conversations with, you know, especially when you realize someone's speaking your language. So you're like, oh, hey, you know, oh, you guys are doing what bricks and blah, 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 blah. And my auntie is just like, blimey. 
all I've ever done is drink it. <laughs> you know, like, you know, just like, <laughs> you know, and I just like, what a, what a bow on that, you know? Because you don't even, there's so many people down here that are like into the nerdy details and stuff. It's great. Mm -hmm. It's great. But yeah, context is key. And, and, you know, a lot of people can talk about Oregon wine, but there's such a, there's such a world out there. And you naturally, like, especially with aged Oregon, we have one of the largest collections of, of aged Oregon wine in, in town. And we open them up too, which is like we did an event called Oregon Doesn't Age question mark. And I mean, long time wine people in this town are just like, dude, no one's done this before. And I was like, again, naively shocked how like, well, if we've got it, they charge like $50 a ticket. We got these 16 wines back to the eighties and let's taste them. Let's like, that's such a pivotal, you, you're going to get people more interested if they can taste it and see what's going on with it. So like we'll do rotating Coravin pours uh, where we'll take, you know, like I've got a 1998 Russian River Valley Pinot Noir open. Stupendous. So many people are like, oh, I, I thought Pinot Noir couldn't age for more than three, five years. You know what I mean? That's still rampant. So. Those anytime, anytime as a sommelier, you can kind of shatter some preconceived notions. That's a win. <laughs> so tell me about building the collection here. Obviously, you mentioned like you have the education component. You have you have a desire to. to uh, so tell me about choosing wines for this place and about sort of building a wine list, whether it's at a restaurant, whether it's at a shop. What are your what are the kind of the keys for you when it comes to building a wine list? Yeah, great question. Um, you know, for for here, I'm I'm grateful because we get to. Uh, I want I want I I believe like Karen McNeil says, you know, wine should be a grocery, not a luxury. And I firmly believe that. You know, like it. I work really hard to make sure there's lots of wines under twenty dollars. There's, there's wines that can be quality that don't break the bank. But that said, we get to really, you know, try to showcase not only the, like, yeah, the best, the best wines in the world, you know, and it doesn't mean the most expensive wines in the world, but that kind of like, Hey, I'm not going to put anything on these shelves that I wouldn't want to pop open for a friend who swung by or a family dinner or something like that. And just from that simple rule alone, that makes things quite easy. You know, when I, I typically try to taste with my reps blind, uh, they, everyone wants to start going into their tech sheets and telling the, you know, winemaker's dog's name and all this stuff. And I'm just like, dude, no customer is going to be having that experience when they're at home. They're going to be essentially tasting this wine blind, you know? And so like those kind of components really, uh, you know, you start to trust in your palate. You start to trust in like, you know, after a certain amount of time, even, you know, I know that people will enjoy this, even if they've never heard of it. But I like to think of it kind of like a playlist. You know, you want your greatest hits. There are certain labels that are mainstays of any serious wine list, you know, or like, you know, if you, you know, there's a difference between like, oh, that's cute. Or, oh, look, they're trying, like, I mean, you could, you could, I could tell from one glance on a wine list, like kind of the, the depth, of, the depth of care, <laughs> you know, how much, how much is someone really, really strewn about this? Is this just some hodgepodge thing that makes no sense? You know, it should be, you know, I like to keep a curated approach here. So, you know, again, no one should have to choose over like five different Pinot Grigios. It just, there isn't that much variability outside of extreme skin contact and stuff. So I try to, you know, kind of have like, you know, good, better, best, or have, you know, maybe one to two tiers, but like, like Condrieu. I'll typically never have more than two bottles of Condrieu. It's just not, there's a lot of love to spread around. And, you know, it's just, yeah, I think that's it. When you're trying to purvey the entire happenings and the what's what in the world of wine, like there's, that's what I love about it. There's still so many producers I'm continuing to learn about. But yeah, with, with wine lists and stuff, you know, I think it's, it's very easy as a sommelier or just a, a wine professional to kind of get stuck in your ways. You're like, hey, this is how I do things. These are the styles I want. And not really reading the room or reading, you know, I think like, you know, upon becoming a master sommelier, one major role that opens up is you tend to, you know, you might not just be a wine director, you might be in a hospitality group that manages programs for multiple restaurants. So now, you know, what works in a steakhouse in Omaha is not going to work, uh, uh, you know, the, at the Ritz in Monterey, maybe, or, or, you know, just you can make a million examples of that. So I think that's one of the most crucial portions of it is like, is that balance between not losing your identity and your 
palate and you know maybe sometimes who you are and also respecting the guest. Conversely, I've seen many people, wine buyers and stuff, go the exact extreme opposite and they just cater to what they think guests want. I think that's also just as much of a sin. You know, I don't care if, yeah, it's like country club atmosphere, or whatever, like that doesn't mean every wine should be above 15% alcohol. And you know, it's just kind of like this, you know, inundation of just the same thing. Um, because most times, you know, like people, people feed off excitement. You know, it's just like if you're talking to a stranger on a bus about a show on Netflix, like they are so much more likely to watch that show with a good conversation and, and, a, and a visible excitement. And, and I, I love the, the patrons we have here that are like, hey, take me on a ride. Or like, hey, build me a case, you know, keep it under 40 bucks a bottle. Like, well, what, what are you into right now? Or, you know, I tell anybody that works here, just anybody uh, uh, looking to enhance their wine service is that, you know, questions are so key and but asking the right ones you know most people don't that's the one that we've all heard this a million times so many people know what they want they just don't know how to describe it you know it's like it's like how i feel when i get my hair cut <laughs> so they have like i'm like i'm like uh hold on let me get this picture from four years ago you know but like if i tell people like you know it's like hey you know you are you looking for something you know brisk and fresh or something with some some richness some roundness you know or or you know rusty and dusty or, or lush and refined, you know, that could be the difference between a Chianti or a, a Napa Cap, you know, and, and a lot of times people will be like, oh, I want Pinot Noir. I like Pinot Noir and Malbec. You know? Okay. Well, let's read through the line. Fruit. They're talking about fruit. Forget the body, forget the country. They want something fruity. And, and, and those kind of reading between the lines is just, it's just, the ways to hone your blade as you get better and better through this. So you've talked a bit about kind of the, the experience and the, and the list here. So what uh, what comes next for the shop? What 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 are you what have you not what have you not done yet that you're excited to try? Yeah, that's uh, so much because also too like you know we've kept things word of mouth. We've kept things you know that that real if you build it they will come mentality and and that's been such an exciting portion of it as well but starting with 2024 we're breaking into education. Uh, so we have this new thing called Crew University uh, and we we start we start been a great initial response. We did a six class series. Just sold out rather quickly so we're working on that next batch but uh uh, uh, my coworker here, uh, Marissa Kipp, she as well is in pursuit of the Master Sommelier title. And so uh, what, I just think the coolest thing about this place, like basically, you know, uh, there's, there's four people, you know, if I'm missing someone out, don't get offended. But I, to my knowledge, there are four people in the state of Oregon pursuing the Master Sommelier title. Two of them work here. And I just think that's so badass <laughs> because, uh, it, again, the context to which to understand things, it's like people can memorize a tech sheet, people can memorize tasting notes and, you know, yeah, they have a, this, this vineyard's 900 feet in, in elevation, you know, like this kind of stuff. But like the how, the why, the what, how does it connect, how, the context to which to understand it and uh, and really just kind of you know, a way to, you know, it's like teaching people to fish. You know, when, when I can introduce somebody to a style of wine they've never had before, you know, you see that light turn on in their eyes. You see that they're engaged now, whereas prior they were just passively drinking and doing something. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, no, so if really for the future of the shot, like we have the education series coming out. And then also, uh, really, it's just kind of building the brand and, and getting that name out there. Uh, we do have like a sister wine bar that's set to construction starting soon. And that's gonna open up in the Pearl in the springtime, uh, which that's just exciting, you know? Cause again, I, it, I learned pretty quickly here, like, you know, it's nice to have a beautiful space to, to, to not only shop for wine, but taste some wine. We don't do a corkage fee. So we'll encourage people to hang out for a little bit, enjoy something off the shelves. Uh, but it didn't take me long to realize people like drinking wine more than like necessarily shopping and stuff. So, you know, I've found that like creating experiences, I think is going to be one of the major components for 2024. We, uh, did a really fun, uh, this was for charity, but we did this really nice wine, uh, dinner that people bid on and we brought out just the murderer's row of collectible wines and getting to do events like that. It was such a smashing success. I think that's something, uh, I look forward to doing. Uh, yeah, we do a monthly like ticketed event and 
yeah, anything I've learned to this crowd, man, if it can be a date night, it's off. It's off to the races, man. Uh, but you know, just like a Wednesday afternoon, it's like, hey, check out this grower champagne and stuff. Like, I mean, again, we, you know, the foot traffic's uh, uh, pretty decent out here, but it's still, you know, we're tucked in our little corner, and and I mean, we didn't do much of any marketing for you know, really the, just a little bit on Instagram, a little bit on that, but. Uh, We've, we've kept it in that grassroots kind of growth phase and we finished the year really strong uh, with a lot of buzz. And again, we're just, I'm just hope to capitalize on that. I think it's just, you know, every single person that walks in here, I want them feeling like a VIP. I want that, you know, uh, anytime I go into a place, someone's remembered my name, you know, it's like, it's not said like, you know, everyone loves the sound of their own name. Uh, but you know, like the, again, those little touches of hospitality, those little touches of, you know, making memories for people as opposed to just a transactional, you know, relation. So I'm excited for what we've built upon and the regulars that we've been able to foster. And uh, it's also, at times, you know, just like, man, I know that like at least half this town doesn't know what we're doing or, or who we are, or what we're doing. So like, it really, we're looking forward to, you know, we're, we're here to stay. We got big ambitions and, and just in, enjoying that ride. But I mean, boy, after, after this call, after this interview, I've got 200 bottles to bag and tag and get working in it. So it's like, what, what's exciting is that the train never stops. Mm -hmm. And that's, I mean, at times it's, it can be a little annoying when maybe you're in, you're on vacation and you're like on the phone for shipping things and stuff like that. Like, you know, the job follows you. Um, and you know, when you have an online store that's 24 seven, you know, most anybody could buy from, uh, yeah, but it's, it's, it's one of those things that I think, and it ties into the sommelier realm. It's like this insatiable thirst. It's this kind of, you know, hyperactive mind. It's uh, staying busy, spinning lots of plates. I mean, and again, you can see why people have success working in restaurants that translate to this. You, you, it, it, it's not for everybody and, and that's okay. But it, for those that like are kind of wired that way, uh, I get a lot of gratification out of it. And it's also like, I could not imagine doing kind of the same one, two, three, or, you know, and again, but to, to another person, that's paradise, you know, and, and it all just depends, like, you know, most people that work in, especially in Michelin, you know, restaurants stuff, or just really any restaurant, I mean, you, you, you kind of thrive on the chaos a little bit, you know, like, I love it when it's just me on the floor here sometimes, like, you know, where I can like, actually get my tail kicked a little bit or like, you know, there, there'd be so many nights leaving, you know, the floor and you're like, man, I am exhausted. I didn't need to do those extra three flights of stairs to just get, you know, a little thing to add a little gag of a joke to, you know, like I mean, this, this, this one time, this one time in Michael Mina, this guest was like, I was getting right into all the spiel, you know, getting all, getting, getting into the spiel. And they're like, oh man, if this is how you, this is how you, you talk about wine. I wonder how they, they, they talk about cereal in the morning or something like that. <laughs> and I was talking about it. This guy, he's like, dude, he went and grabbed a little thing of milk and a little, we had these like little grains that were a portion of the dessert. And we did a little like cereal, you know, as a total gag, but just like they were not expecting it. They're like, it's at the end of the night, their bill is already paid. And they're like, oh, and for, for your final surprise course, we've got this one, you know, but like, you know, creating that little memorable experience, getting to have a little fun with it. But uh, yeah, again, you know, it's, I think like uh, to, I've been trying to have this place be a bit of a lightning rod for the community that I've left because, a, you know, and I was warned, <laughs> frankly, by people in SF, they're like, dude, don't go to Portland. It's a dead zone. No one does any, I mean, from a fine dining standpoint, I understand why they said that. You know, you're, no, no one's hiring a full-time sommelier, <laughs> you know, to work in a restaurant outside of Canlis uh, uh, up here. but. That being said, like, I, I'm really glad I didn't listen to them because, you know, all the elements are here. Mm -hmm. They just, you know, the, the passion, the, the curiosity, the, the local love, you know, and, and sure, you know, I'm all for Oregon wine. Like moving up here has been such a nice revelation into like, just, you know, I thought I knew my 15 producers, I think it was 600 some odd producers out there, you know, it, 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 there's 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 light and dark sides to it. You know, I, I learned that I was in a snow globe in, in, in SF a bit from the Oregon standpoint. All I was working with was the best. You know, again, like the Evening Land, the, the Antique Terra stuff. I, you know, that was my entry level Pinot Noir. So, 
you know, tasting some like verticals of some stuff. I'm like, oh yeah, 09? Oh, 09 should be tasting like this. It should be at this stage. It's gonna be great. And you tasted something, you're like, and I was like, whoa, this wine's busted. And you know, maybe they're adding some, you know, who, you know, who knows what was going on, you know, with the one, but like, that was a, a, a the uh, uh, eye-opening moment was realizing that, whoa, like not every wine ages like the best. And then, okay, well now what's my next step? Like, yeah, one uh, best thing I ever, someone told me, so I hope someone gets value from it here is like, when, when, when on the fence of whether to age a certain wine or not, like always pursue owner slash winemakers. For New World wines, for America, you know, Chile, whatever, when you have an owner slash winemaker, like that's a certain investment. They're, they want their grandkids tasting those wines. And as opposed to, um, I'm the hired person, you know, like don't, don't, don't upset the, the club members or the investors, you know, it's a different, it's a different approach. So that was something that, that was eye opening for me there. But moreover, you know, between a lot of the vintage Oregon wines we've been able to purvey here and just tasting and, you know, whether it's like the Deep Roots Coalition, things like that, like always, always love attending that and the, and, and getting to see all the people involved with that. But you know, like there's too many producers to name drop, but there's so many exciting things. Amphora wines, I mean, Chardonnay, no secret, right? Like the fact that Oregon's finally figured out Chardonnay is probably, you know, this is what's gonna take Willamette Valley to that next echelon. Uh, and, and you know, this is, you know, off camera, but we're talking the, the, the kind of, the new wave of winemakers right now. And you see this, and it's the same in France, the same as other things, you know, except in France, they're born into the family, but they send them off to New Zealand, they send them off to Argentina, they send them off to all these places, get those experience, get that exposure, and then come back here and figure out how to do it right. And <laughs> and you're seeing, you know, you're seeing people uh, out there doing these things. Uh, and yeah, you know, the fact that, you know, I'm sure everyone knows that, that whole Wenty clone fiasco, you know, and people probably lost their retirement funds just planting stuff blindly. Uh, and it really set the region back, you know, like Pinot Gris should have never been as big of a crepe as, it, as it's been for here. You know, it was literally just like, here's something 17 bucks to cushion the blow for these, whatever the price, Pinot Noirs. But yeah, Chardonnay is so exciting right now. And, and you know, you're seeing people having success with Syrah and you know, a little bit with Gruner Veltliner, things like that. I, this is where like I get in my own way sometimes where like a lot of people are like, oh, this wine's great. But I'm like, if it's Gruner Veltliner, I'm holding it to the standard of Vakau, of Comtal, of like the, 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 a tip, the typical style of that grape. So there are times where, you know, maybe I'm not the biggest fanboy because I'm just like, well, it's a neutral white wine and it, you know, sure, but it's not as expressive as, you know, it's, you know, sometimes you're like, well, there's a reason Tempranillo is like, you know, mainstays out there, you know, temp a lot of times international grapes, you know, sometimes they lose that spirit, that essence, that soul of their European counterparts. That's what makes it so exciting when you taste someone's wine that is dead on. Yeah, like I had uh, Raj Pars Phelan Farm Wines out of California. Yeah, he's making Mencia. The first time I tried it, I mean, I didn't know what the wine was. Like, I, I was like, dude, this is Spain, 100. You know what I mean? Like, that was like an eye-opening thing because it fooled me big time. But a lot of times, you know, like Italian grapes grown in Oregon or even California, seldom are they really like dead ringers, but you got, you know, Cameron doing the Nebbiolo uh, uh, based out of, you know, Barbaresco vineyards and stuff. And, and you're seeing these steps and you're seeing this promise and excitement. So yeah, I mean, it's a fun ride. And I think like with anybody, I, I, I sometimes don't know if people realize just how special Willamette Valley is in the timeline of things. 60 years we're talking, barely. 60 years and it's done this much and it's become, you know, this renowned. I'd argue only Marlboro, New Zealand can, can argue, you know, a faster ascension, I'd say. And, and so between those two regions, uh, yeah, so many great things, you know, just as, as people are, hey, there's more up here than Pinot Noir, you know, Marlboro, New Zealand, there's more than just Sauvignon Blanc. They're, they're doing so many great things out there too. So yeah, that's, that's just where, you know, like we're, we're all uh, people around here are very privileged to have such a, such a high quality region, you know, and, and uh, 
yeah, you know, keeping that beginner's mind and, and, and thankfulness and, and gratitude approach, I think, is key. So you mentioned that you're on the cusp of sitting for the master psalm exam coming up this spring. So tell us a little bit about what that entails and about sort of the so your preparation and thoughts going in. Yeah, I got a lot of them <laughs> uh, every day. No, but um, yeah, it's 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 wild, man. I uh, I'm sitting I'm sitting the master sommelier theory exam in April. It's being held out in Atlanta, Georgia. The irony is that it was held in Portland the last couple years, uh, but I've never been to Atlanta, so let's have some fun with it. But yeah, man, it, it, it is crazy because when you start on the wine journey, it's like it's so into. Like we talked about the intimidation factor, this kind of dude, it's just like the Mount Everest approach. Where you're like, man, how on earth am I going to get there? And you know, we're not all Zen Buddhists at heart or Psycho you know, series, one step at a time. You know. Uh, but by keeping the blinders up, like I'm, I myself am having that kind of moment of like, whoa, like we're like the finish line's in sight. We're, we're like kind of right here because all these memories that we've kind of touched on a few is like of the people that I've worked with that were at this point trying to achieve it. At that time, it's like, man, it's like being a freshman hanging out with seniors and you're like, man, these people are like 25 years old. You know, like, it's like, that's how it feels at the time. Uh, and now, so like really the operative word is just excitement. I was very, very grateful uh, in that role at Michael Mina, whereas I wasn't hired as a sommelier, I was treated as such. And uh, they were pursuing the MS theory exam at that time and I got invited into their theory group and so here I had just passed my certified I mean it's hard to illustrate in a clever phrase of like just how huge the the gap is between you know like certified and the advanced master's levels I mean it's monstrous and yeah, you know, those were very stressful night before the the theory groups. You know, I was always I'll still occasionally rev look at the questions I wrote at that time and I'm Oh man, you shouldn't have phrased it like this. You shouldn't have phrased it like I'm correcting myself now from that. That's the growth of it. But I was, I was very grateful to get into this uh, master's theory group at a time when you know I was nowhere near that level. And so now it's been, and I've been able to stay in groups such as that and build upon that. And now I've got a theory group. We meet online. You know, people from all over the country. And this has been going on for years. So. Yeah, I'm just so excited to get to put my hat in the ring. And I mean, you're, dude, it's the highest probability of failure. That's the other thing. Like, the, you can't, there's obviously people gather stress for different reasons. And the more times you are unsuccessful, the more pressure it puts on you. How long am I going to sacrifice so many hours? And sometimes, you, 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 if you're not successful enough times, you get out in the woods and you're like, I gotta name every pine cone and I gotta know every Latin phrase for every type of bark virus, you know, and you start getting into this land of minutia and that's not beneficial either. Um, but yeah, like to, to, to get to put my hat in the ring, I was say for context, like last year, uh, so for those that don't don't know, listening is like for the master sommelier title, you have to pass the theory portion. That's the gate of entry. If you do not pass theory, you will perpetually, or you, if they'll make you sit out a year if you are unsuccessful three years in a row. But yeah, you do not pass go or collect anything until you pass theory. And then upon passing theory, you have the next like two years more or less to pass tasting and service. So in that regard, it's like, you know, you could almost have like a whole year where you just need to focus on one portion of the exam. But if after three years you haven't passed all three, you have to reset and re yeah, like, there's stories of like people that burned all their note cards after passing theory, thinking they were a shoe in for the other parts. Like, oh, I'm great at service. I'm a great taster. <laughs> and then like, we're, yeah, dude, it sucks. <laughs> uh, but that's just exactly it. Like, yes, technically, like if I was to, uh, if, if I was to be fortunate enough to pass, you know, in, in theory, that could be like some of the last times. Like, you, some people never have to look at a, a note card again, you know, and that's a, a, a total different conversation. But uh, yeah, yeah, getting the chance to actually put my hat in the ring. Like I was saying last year, 105 sat theory and five passed. So, you know, I mean, that's like, it's usually around like a two to 3% pass rate. And you sit basically across the table from like, three or so 
master psalms and it's a ver the thing is, is what's really tough is it's an oral exam whereas all the other ones up until that you at least can like see the words on paper so and not only are you battling with their accents uh, you know at times but still like oh man i mean the difference between some chilean terms versus argentinian terms versus the odd madeira uh, uh, azores island you know like they you know a phrase could sound you know like they're based in a certain dialect you know it's so easy to get thrown all about and it's you know some somewhere around 120 questions uh about like 50 minutes and the kicker is you have to pass a 75 percent uh, like I've, there are people who have gotten a 74 sorry oh so close see you next year you know um so very very brutal to say the least and it can come down to like one or two questions so like even when you think you're you know, oh man, I know I got these five wrong. Or like, I mean, like it's the mental, like right now in these next two and a half months, I'm trying to, you know, it's, it's mental stamina. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's the mental stamina portion of it. It's, it's the, you know, not losing focus. You know, that's something too, like your brain starts to go soft after like 70 questions or, you know, you start like looking at the time or maybe a balloon flies out the window and, you know, or like, you know, your eyes start wandering off. So like, that's for me trying to really, really hone in and, uh, and just take it in stride. But yeah, I think it, there's a lot of reasons why people can add pressure to themselves. For, I think going into an exam that has such a high probability of failure, how that should de-stress you right there like i'm like like this i'm you were you were actually going into a, a losing situation and it is like you know it's like I, I i should view this more as like playing the wine lotto but like in these types of exams many have said before it's not yes you, you of course you can prepare for it but the exams tend to not be something you can prepare for have you been to Tunu tunisia have you had Reiki from, you know, uh, you know, like what's the base flavoring spirit uh, uh, agent of this? And, and you know, uh, what season is this mold procured for sake production? You know, like, I mean, the questions at times can get, and there's always going to be some FU questions, we call them, where they're like, you know, there's always a few in there. Uh, absolutely. Um, but yeah, the kind of, without putting words in the court's mouth, they've always known they've kind of, they kind of keep, eh, they're, they're changing their ways. They're being much more open and, and uh, about like the examination process as a whole, like giving really great feedback and, and breakdowns of categories. And this is where you need to work on. This is where you did great. Uh, but a lot of the mantra maybe unspoken has been like, hey, we're gonna kind of keep you in the dark a little bit so you can run really, really far. Maybe you ran past where you needed to go, but you're better for it because you did it. And that was like when I was, first sitting the advanced sommelier exam which that was like a whole behemoth in itself I, I just passed it in july which is exciting it took me it was my third attempt to pass it and for advanced you, whereas the master sommelier exam you get three years total to pass all portions the advanced you have three days in which you take all three and then you find out pass or fail. And yeah, first year I went two for three. I passed theory, I passed tasting, I didn't pass service. The second year I passed service, but I didn't have my best flight. And so tasting held me back the second year. Like even in, in although at that point I had now passed every portion <laughs> uh, and then, you know, COVID happened and whatnot. And, uh, you know, it's not easy to get back on the horse and, you know, especially you know, failing at anything, it's not easy to get back into it. But uh, uh, yeah, it definitely got the monkey off my back in, in July. I was able to pass that. And uh, for me, it was weird that like most people get the advanced level and they're like, I'm good. Like, I, and they're right. You know, you can get any job. You can, you know, hotel, whatever the case. Like, you can, you can make a full blown career at yourself for the, the advanced title. Uh, that was never the end goal. And it became, sadly, like I was not even that, of course, excited about it, but like my, my mind was already on the match. I was like, I just want to get this out of the way so I can get to where I've been, you know, like people that I studied with that have now been there, you know, it's like we're all on the same race, just at different speeds. And, and, and so, yeah, you know, I can't just from that community component, I can't wait to go see a bunch of people I have, you know, haven't seen in four or five years or people that will now be sitting across the table 
uh, you know, proctoring my exams and telling me my, you know, my questions, you know, it's like, man, you know, uh, I'm excited for that, that kind of full circle approach to it. But yeah, man, it's anything anyone in the world would want to drink and pertinent information about it. Really? That's like the best, easiest kind of way to put it around. I mean, it's, and it's, it's, you know, what, you know, uh, uh, the Monashi Mountains affect which wine region primarily, blah, 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 you know, the Elba River, you know, in Sachsen, Germany, it, it, it's, it's, you know, rivers, soils, the types of wines allowed, who makes this wine, arrange these three vintages in Muscadet from best to worst, uh, which of the last, which vintages of the last 10 years had hail in Burgundy, you know, I mean, that's just from a weather component. Uh, you know, who was this person in the influential winery they helped with? You know, I mean, like that, there really is no uh, um, end to where it could go. But as I prepare for this kind of <laughs> Herculean task, uh, I just tried, like, my, my wife said, like, a long time ago, just, like, just really try to remember what you're doing this for and, and why you're doing this for. And, and again, you know, there's people that, hey, you know, I really like this, it's tasty, yum, having a good time. And then there's those people that are like, I wanna know why. Or kind of like, if you ever like been in a car and you're like, man, that movie, that actor, God, what was that actor's name? And if it bugs you enough, like where you're like, I have to look this up or I'm not going to be all right for a minute. Like if you're that type, you probably have a, a potential to be a sommelier, or a, you, you probably have a career in wine if you want, because it is that little tick. It's that little like, you know, I really, really want to know. And, and yeah, like I was definitely a precocious child and I was, I was definitely, you know, at, at times, you know, like a, a little know-it-all, you know, at times I've been accused. Uh, so it's fun, like siblings of mine, it's funny, like they're just like, oh, you, you, man, you were like that. You were like, I don't like this, but I like that. And I don't like cheese, only if I'm on pizza, you know, whatever the case, you know, like, like hearing that kind of stuff. And, and it's funny, like my, my, my dad, I didn't really uh, know that well through my life, but when we, when we kind of met, I found out that like he worked on, you know, he worked on cruise ships like in the eighties and stuff like that. And he was like, oh yeah, I was a wine steward. And yeah, he's British and all that stuff. So I was like, oh, wine steward was a fancy blah, blah, blah. You know, like, like that sounded like a water boy kind of thing or something. I don't know. It just didn't say, and then I look into it and it's like, no, that's the British term for sommelier. Mm -hmm. You know, so like even like little, like those are kind of cute little cherries on the, on, on the tree or something like that. But yeah, you know, definitely the path in wine was anything but paved. Uh, yeah, I know friends that, you know, have been popping open fancy bottles for their parents since they were 12 and they became at master sommeliers at like 26, 27. That's like the youngest anyone's ever been to pass it. Uh, but yeah, for me, it's just kind of been a, it's just been a journey. It's been a, it's been a fun ride and saying yes to everything and trying, you know, any wine style at least twice and just kind of enjoying the ride, man. Just enjoying the ride. Like there's, it's, it's you're never going to know everything and i think you know i think that's got to be you know a shared sentiment towards you know anyone working in wine long enough you know it's you devote your most people when they pass the master's only exam tend to focus on one major topic mm -hmm. maybe it's madeira maybe it's sake because it's impossible to master everything and stay at that forever I've got note cards I made in 2018 that are obsolete. <laughs> you know, it really like, it, that's what's tough too, man. You burn those flashcards and then you got to take theory again. And you know, what, I mean, Mount Pisgah, Polk County, and Lower Long Tom, like, our community is the only ones uh, a little exasperated whenever new growth and change occur in the Willamette Valley. Everyone's like, hey, yeah, another another little identifier. And we're like, oh, great, another thing to bloody memorize. You know, like, it could be kind of taxing like that. But uh, it, I try to remember the fun in it. And, you know, it's it's fun to learn. It's fun. You, I always say this about someone, you, you got to love to learn. You got to love to share what you've learned. Mm -hmm. And that's something that, no matter what you're studying for, if you if you learn a new piece of information and you you think immediately about like how am I going to teach this to somebody, like that's already proven to lock in your head a bit more. There's so many little, you know, mnemonic devices that we all kind of create to really, because I mean it. it 
I'm at that point right now where I'm trying to, you know, uncross as many wires as possible because again, when you're in that stressful situation, there's nothing worse than getting a question wrong you know you know. Mm -hmm. And they will, the test is designed to, like, here's a great example. They'll, uh, they'll like, they'll ask, uh, who makes this bottling? And so you get it wrong. And then they'll say, that producer who you just got wrong is based in what village? You know, or like they'll, they'll they'll tell you the answer. So then, usually, when you hear the right answer, you know it, and you're thinking about that last question instead of the task at hand. So I mean, that's just one of the tiny micro. And again, those are all just campfire stories. I'll I'll be learning firsthand uh, with <laughs> that stuff. But I, I I'm I'm ex I'm just excited for it. And and again, like there there's no race. And I'm grateful that even at my unsuccessful attempts when I was working at Lazy Bear, like, you know, the wine director there, uh, Matt Dully, was, you know, he's a great friend and, and was really instrumental in, in me becoming a better sommelier. And, you know, I was really moved when, you know, myself and my coworker at the time both came back unsuccessfully. And, you know, we'd, we'd been working our tails off for this, you know, every eating our family meal, quizzing each other, you know, every single day, even at working, they think we're talking about the next course. We're talking about like sub regions of Bulgaria, uh, you know, but you know, it was that kind of thing of like, you know, he said something along the lines of like, most people in the country right now are going for these exams and whatnot to try and work at a job that we already have and to to be at the level we were at and to still pursue something with a high degree of failure and all that stuff and like i don't know he he like took that 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 topic path of like just kind of the bravery that it takes and and like in any whether it's wine or sports or anything where you're really like man you're putting yourself out there in a lot of cases nothing for for no more than just your own self betterment and your own you know personal growth and I think that's what keeps me in it, you know, the, the pursuit of excellence and kind of, I don't know, comically most when they're like, oh, what are you going to do when you become a master show? And it's like, well, become a professional musician, duh, <laughs> what I always wanted to do. And now I got, now I got this accomplishment box checked, <laughs> like, and it's funny because I was like, man, I got to stop joking like that. I got to actually figure out what the truth of it, but, you know, who knows? Maybe I can get like a really cool live music bar with a dope wine program and uh, marry the two one day, but yeah, no, it's, it's exciting and, uh, and the goal is to pass before I'm 35, so I'm on pace and I'm excited for the opportunity. Uh, tell us about an unreal bottle of wine that you've had. Oh, man. I, I'd ha okay, I mean, I've, man, I've been lucky. I've been lucky uh, to have a few, but one in particular, um, Will had, or the owner, he'd always, he'd known, a, I had never had uh, Chateau Reyes. Uh, Chateau Reyes is a Chateau de Pop producer, southern France, 100% Grenache, and one of the holiest of holies. Uh, they it just uh, one of ones. And th th you know, I forget when I even brought up that I had. I mean, heck, I could look into you know 50 marquee wines that I still have yet to taste. So there's tens of thousands, uh, but we love to blind taste here. We love to, we put a little sleeve on the bottle and we're always pouring it for others like, hey, what's this? And we're sitting there opening a few bottles and Will goes, you know, and he puts the sleeve on something and I'm blind tasting this wine. And I'm like, man, well, this is really good, of course. You know, I'm going through, like, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking of what is it? So I'm not in the mindset of like, I'm on the beach enjoying myself. I'm like, find out what this wine is. And I start building the case for Grenache. And I'm like, man, this is as beautiful as the best red burgundy. It was hard not to think Pinot Noir thoughts, but it just like, I just had this awe moment, like a nerdy reference, but like, like, like when Harry Potter has his wand in his hand and like all the lights and the, the winds blowing and stuff like that. I like, it felt like that moment. And I just thought, it was like, could this be like, I was like, I think, I think this could be what Chateau Ray, like you, I'm trying to blind taste something that I've never bloody tasted before. So I'm going through, I'm like, could this be? And I'm like, could this be Reyes? I'm like saying it like as a whisper, like I'm afraid to speak it into existence. And he pulls the sleeve and it was a 2007 Chateau Reyes. It's over $2,000 retail bottle. And I just like, I'll never, my goodness. Like, I mean, just like, I mean, hey, nailing it on a blind wine, blind tasting is great. But like, that was the first time I was like, 
could this be what I always hoped it would be? And that's where like, man, where note cards translate to this. Sometimes it don't translate. Sometimes I'm like, oh man, I've been studying this wine. It's not that good though. <laughs> like it's a little hairy for my taste. Uh, you know, oh, well, you know, the kid took over. And, uh, but like the, the, the wine was just uh, immaculate and, and yeah. Uh, like I said, I still try to think of the, you know, my best wines are still to come, but that's something I'll never forget. And, you know, that's again, where like the owner of this place, he's a firm believer. It's like, you know, people, this, we're in a generational gap right now where, you know, there's going to be, need to be a new generation that t gets into this stuff. Uh, and getting to open those wines and pour them for people that don't have the means or the accessibility. I mean, that's something that we've too uh, become kind of known for. And man, I've, I've seen, I've seen people wipe tears away from wines that we've been able to pour here. And like, that, that means something that like, that's a, that's a spe I don't care who you are. You know, you're like, man, like that's cool. That's cool. Like when you get, when, when, when things can get put on a pedestal, but like when you can create that sensation and that experience. So yeah, that 07 Chateau Reyes that will uh, stay with me for some time. Well, excellent. That's all the questions that I have for you. Uh, anything I didn't ask today that I should have anything that we didn't cover that you'd like to cover here? No, I think, um, well, you know, I mean, hopefully we're talking about Oregon wine a little bit and stuff like, you know, the, fu the future is really bright and I'm excited. I'm, I think it's great what you guys are doing right here and capturing that history and everybody's coming at it from a different angle. And I think, you know, you're providing a lot of puzzle pieces that people will look back on and, and really be able to say like, hey, man, that's, that's I don't know what other regions are doing this, you know, and stuff like that. So kudos to you guys and I'm uh, excited to see what you guys continue to do. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. And best of luck this April at the, the beginning of the end stage here for you. Thank so. you all. If, if, if I pass, we're having a party here and you all are invited. So, <laughs> so keep, keep that on note. <laughs> Excellent. Will do. Thanks, thanks for so, having thanks me. Thanks so much for your time. Appreciate it. Go ahead and let you off the hook. Awesome. Thank you guys.